Um, I'm going to assume that a lot of you weren't at, didn't see the Hayward show, and I'm going to start just by showing a small um, three-minute um, extract from one of the films um, that was completed in 2011 called Shadow Sites 2. It was the sister film to the film that was shown at the Hayward. Um, and then I'm going to follow that by talking a little bit about the, the research and the development of the project and um, show you some of the archival material that I've looked at that's informed the development of the work. So I'm just going to start by showing this short clip and then I'll stop it. This is a, it's an eight and a half minute film. It's normally shown as a very large projection in a self-contained space. Um, so I shall just get on with that. So, so Shadow Sites 2 is part of a larger body of work, um, and the title of this body of work is The Aesthetics of Disappearance, which is borrowed from Virilia, um, A Land Without People. Um, and the story starts with an article that I came across in 2004 in The Independent um, about British forensic anthropologist Margaret Cox. Uh, Margaret Cox was working at that point in Iraq after the 2003 war, and part of her job was uncovering the mass graves of the victims of Iraqi, the Iraqi state's genocide and trying to identify the, identify the victims and return their bodies to their families. But the article started with um, <clears throat> a description of her work from the late 90s in Kosovo, and I was really struck by, by the story of her talking about going out into the countryside in Kosovo and looking for a blue butterfly, a particular species of blue butterfly. And the reason she was looking for this butterfly is because it feeds exclusively on a wildflower called Artemisia vulgaris. And so she would go out with her team and they would find 
these flowers growing on mass, and wherever they found the flowers growing on mass, they would dig. And the reason that they did this was that the soil had been disturbed because there were mass graves underneath, and the flowers had grown because the seedbed had been disturbed. So I was very struck by this idea that in, in war, um, and um, the way in which the, the, the bodies of civilians or victims are disappeared into the landscape often, in ways that are subtle and, and hard to find, but that there's some, always on the surface of the ground, there is some kind of evidence of this disturbance. Um, and because she was working in 2003, I, was, I went back to looking again at my, I'd done some work previously about the, 2000, the 1991 Gulf War, and the way, in, and again, reading Virilio, um, thinking about the way in which this war was so radical in terms of how it was represented. So it was the first, um, I think Virilia described it as the first um, total electronic war. And, um, and the important thing about this war was that we saw it as observers. Um, the press image of the war was an aerial image. So it was the first time that the war was kind of, war was fought almost exclusively, or represented almost exclusively from the air. And one of the things that that did, from my perspective, was disappear the population on the ground. So I was interested in this idea of the literal disappearance of the body in the landscape and the virtual disappearance of the body in the landscape through technology and through this aerial perspective. Um, the other thing I was also interested in, and the second part of the title, which is A Land Without People, um, is it come, and it comes from the uh, controversial um, a sort of rallying call for the early Zionists of, and it's a description of Palestine, Palestine being a land without people for a people without a land. So again, this idea of thinking about um, occupying a space and needing to represent that space as, as already unoccupied or empty and barren and how that linked to the Orientalist 19th century idea of the desert, the idea that the desert is a, an available and unoccupied space. Um, so I started looking not just at um, military photography and the history of military photography, in particular aerial reconnaissance, but also looking at the relationship between photography and landscape and looking at photographers who were working in the Middle East and landscape in particular. And I came across this body of work in the Freer and Sackler archives in Washington. Um, and this photograph is a photograph from a collection they own of the German archaeologist Ernst Herzfeld. And he was working in the Middle East from the kind of early... 20th century into the mid-1930s. And one of the things that was interesting to me about his work was that he was a very, as a very keen amateur photographer, he'd been photographing not just the sites that he was excavating and the objects, but he was also photographing the, the landscape within which the sites sat, which for archaeological photography is quite unusual. Um, but I was very struck by these two images, which were in the archive, because they own all his negatives and his test prints. And this is an image of a very famous archaeological site in just south of Baghdad in modern-day Iraq. And in the first photograph, which is a rough, uh, a rough test print, you see the sh his shadow in the foreground. Um, and then in the second image, which he's retouched, he's removed his shadow. And, um, and one of the reasons... And, and it, so it reminded me of the story in, in uh, Virilio's... Um, essay, The Aesthetics of Disappearance, where he describes Melies, George Melies, the early film pioneer, and how he was experimenting with moving image, his early experiments with moving image, which he carried out in the street in Paris. He talked about how the camera, when the camera was rolling at some point, um, the camera f failed and the, ca and the film jammed. And then when he got the film rolling again, and after he'd processed the film, he saw that what what the technology, this very simple accident of technology had allowed for figures in the landscape to either disappear completely or for there to be a kind of magical transformation. So, you know, a woman would turn into a man or a, um, you know, a, a horse and cart would appear and disappear miraculously. So I was very interested in that idea that for the, in, in a very simple way, the kind of um, the magical possibilities of what photography and film can offer in terms of what's rep being represented. Um, there is some more images of Hertzfeldt. One of the things I was really struck by was images like this, where he's photographing a landscape, and it's not apparent when you look at the photograph what the subject of the photograph is. You don't see an obvious archaeological site or a, a place of interest. These very barren 
almost kind of uh, lunar landscapes or kind of extraordinary. So this is an example of a shot in which there is an archaeological site in the foreground, but right on the far end, on the right, there's a, a tiny little raised bit, like a spike on the horizon. And that's actually uh, this very famous um, ziggurat in, in Samara. And, uh, you know, the fact that he was representing it in this way, in this peripheral way, was very interesting to me. Um, then I started looking, trying to investigate and look at the earliest um, aerial reconnaissance photographs I could find from military conflict. So I was looking at these images that I found in the Air and Space Museum archives, again in Washington, which were taken by a unit of the American Air Force um, that was established by Edward Steichen. He was invited to set up this photography unit. And so pilots were flying regularly out over the Western Front and photographing troop movements and you know, making, coming back, processing the films and uh, the plates, there were large plates, and printing quite quickly to show, you know, so that strategic decisions could be made on the ground. And because it's very late in the war, the landscape is almost completely, well, firstly, because it's an aerial perspective, it's completely flattened. But secondly, because it's been going, the war has been going on for so long and there's been so much intense fighting and shelling, most of the structures, all of the trees have disappeared. So you have this very flat ground on which these extraordinary abstract and quite beautiful patterns emerge. So these squiggly lines are actually um, trenches. Um, here's another example. So here you can see the intense shelling, how it's left this kind of pockmarked landscape. And what was happening was they were flying over and over again over the same sites. Sites like the one on the left here, which is a fort, which is then, you know, bombed from the, uh, from the air, but also on the ground is shelled. And then on the third image on the right, it's almost completely obliterated. But there's still just a very faint sign of a kind of footprint of the building. So I was struck by the way in which, you know, taking this pers aerial perspective can completely disappear what's actually going on on the ground. So this complete and utter carnage in the trenches is totally cleaned and aestheticized. Um, I started looking at archaeologists who are working in the Middle East, who are working from the air. So looking at the way in which aerial archaeology develops out of the First and Second World Wars, you know, the military flights that are going on across Europe during the First and Second World Wars actually led to a revolution in archaeology because people were discovering as they were flying over the landscapes that sites that had never been seen on the ground before were visible from the air, and particularly early in the morning and late in the afternoon when the sun was very low in the sky and it's casting long shadows, often sites that would be even invisible at midday would suddenly appear miraculously. So I was very struck by this idea of the landscape almost acting like a kind of uh, holding a latent image of a structure. Um, almost like an unprocessed film uh, or plate negative. So these photographs are actually ones that I found in a book um, in the Arab Image Archives of a French archaeologist called um, Antoine Poidebar, who was working in the 30s, 40s, 30s, 20s, 30s, and 40s in what is now Lebanon and Syria. He was mainly interested in Roman archaeology, but took some really extraordinary images. These are just a selection of very rough photocopies, but you know, sort of on the bottom right there, some of them looking actually like some of the aerial photographs of, I don't know, post um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings or, you know, looking like the effects often of contemporary warfare rather than looking like the ancient sites that they actually are. There's some more examples of his work. So if you look at that one on the bottom right, it's kind of extraordinary. It looks like there's a kind of zero, point zero in the center of the image and then everything else is radiating out. Radiating out. Oh, this is just a book. So one of the people who really influenced my thinking was um, uh, Kitty Hauser, the English art historian, who'd written a book called, um, well, the full title of the book is Shadow Science Photography, Archaeology in the British Landscape. So she's looking at the period after the First World War and, and beyond the Second World War. And the way in which um, photography, the, the relationship between photography and flight really shifted the way in which British artists were thinking about landscape. Um, so I'd been filming, this is a, sh a, a location shot from a shoot that I did in Jordan in the Middle East in 2004. 
And I put this in because it shows the landscape that we're working in, which is a very stony, um, volcanic landscape. Um, and on the ground were all these um, dry, stone, dry stone structures that looked like cairns. And it was obvious there was some kind of order to them. They were not just randomly placed. And it was only afterwards that I started looking at aerial archaeology of the region that I found a book by two British archaeologists who've been working in Jordan for the last 20 years. And these, this photograph is showing the same landscape that we were filming in, but from the air you suddenly see all of these structures. So these are prehistoric um, stone, dry stone wall structures that they think are something to do with either corralling animals or homesteads or some kind of, not really sure what they are. Um, so I started to look more carefully at their work and very interestingly for archaeologists they were also working right up to you know, mid 20th century. So they had photographs of what are now considered archaeological sites with these trench systems in the south of Jordan which were actually dug by Ottoman troops under German orders during the First World War and which have survived almost intact. Um, and so you know, that, the way in which the landscape of the Middle East in some ways hadn't shifted and is still showing the scars of something like the First World War battles compared to Europe where everything disappears under you know, farming and, and vegetation very quickly was very striking. Um, and there are also kind of iconic shapes that appear over and over again, which I play with in the film. So this is a, an airway marker. So the British Air Force used to run a postal service between Cairo and Baghdad. And before radar and um, radio telecommunications, they would get lost. The planes would lose their way in the desert. So they, would, so they stamped out these numbered markets, almost like doing a kind of join the dots across the landscape. And some of them are still, still survive. So I decided to film a number of the locations I found in this book. So what I was interested in was the way in which this landscape, the Jordanian landscape, which is kind of a very important crossroads historically um, between all sorts of warring empires, how so much of its history was still visible and, re and, and readable in the landscape. So countering the kind of myth of the desert being empty and unoccupied, I wanted to try and trace these signs of occupation, some quite complicated and sophisticated like this Roman fort, others much more ephemeral. So at the bottom of this image is a, the remains of a copper mine, a, a Bronze Age copper mine, and this blackness on the surface of the soil is actually copper contamination, which is still visible. And again, look to me, I mean, this is a time when the Rwandan genocide was going on, and not, sorry, not Rwanda, um, the, the burning of villages in Darfur, and often the aerial images of those villages were very kind of reminiscent of this scorching on the landscape. So I decided to go kind of in terms of the technology to work very simply with the earliest um, system of photographing from the air in a sense, which is a, a small plane, a small unsophisticated plane and a camera. So we hired a plane in the south of Jordan and then made the photographs which appeared in the film I've just shown you from the air, um, very simply. So there are two films from the Shadow Sight series. I think I forgot to say, actually. So a Shadow Sight, just to explain the technical term, <coughs> is a, an archaeological site that only appears when the sun is low in the sky and you're up above it, directly above it, looking down at it vertically. So these are some of the locations that we... Oh, five minutes, great. So, um, so from ancient, you know, so this is a, another Roman um, fort, and then looking at kind of contemporary, this is citrus farming. And what was happening, as I said earlier, is that you see the kind of recurrence of certain forms and shapes, so the circle and the square and the rectangle, um, you know, appear from the, some of the earliest known kind of human settlements up until contemporary. So this is, for example, is a road layout. But one of the things I was very, wanted to be very careful to do was not, to, not just to focus on the Middle Eastern landscape, because this is a kind of, it's contested and it's, uh, and it's very complex, and I didn't want to um, look at it in isolation. So one of the things I did was also to film a photograph in the American Midwest. So I went to Phoenix in Arizona and f flew out of Phoenix into the Sonoran Desert and photographed a number of sites there too, which were made later made into animated films. <laughs> 
So this, for example, is the footprint of an internment camp where Japanese Americans were interred during the Second World War. So all the buildings have disappeared, but the footprints of the buildings are still visible. Um, I was looking at farming as well, so industrial farming. So this is cattle farming on a kind of grand scale. Um, again, industrial arable farming. So these circular field systems also appear in the Middle Eastern um, films. Um, this is a field system that's been exported globally. So you see, I mean, if you look on Google Earth, north of Saudi Arabia, it's completely covered now in these green circular fields where they're desalinating water from the Red Sea and um, completely self-sufficient now in terms of wheat. Um, and also looking at mining. So one of the big things that happens in the Sonoran is copper mining. This is one of the biggest dam structures in the world. So this is a mine which just is simply a giant <laughs> hole in the ground. Um, this is another mine. So uh, triangles as well. It's another recurring kind of uh, icon. This is the, um, the runway, all that's left of... Uh, um, an American Air Force air base that where um, and quite large areas of the Sonoran are already or out of bounds in any case because they're still military training grounds, but these are the ones that were left over from the Second World War. And then I'm going to just finish on this one, which is a, it's a quarry up in the mountains, but I, I just to kind of come back full circle, and uh, I mean, this one was really striking for me because it's a you know, it's a kind of, it's a, a spectacular earthwork, but it also looks to me a lot like a flayed body. So you get this kind of anthropomorphic figure in the landscape, literally. Okay, so I think I can stop there now. Thank you.